In the tunnel. In the tunnel. In the tunnel. You're listening to In the Tunnel. Hello and welcome to In the Tunnel, episode number 96. Yeah. Um, we are just trying to recap some of the things that have happened so far in the NFL to start with. So, um, well, the NFL has a Monday night playoff game this year. Yes, they indeed had one. Had one, um, yeah. They chose... A pandemic to start doing Monday night games. Amazingly, the pandemic did not cause it to be a Monday night game. Yeah, they just they decided that this was a good idea. Yeah, um, I mean, personally, I don't think it's a good idea. No, but hey, a- uh, they did it already, so there's nothing much we can do about it. They did it, and uh, it's definitely not the reason why the Arizona Cardinals did not show up for that game. It was probably more, you know, they had lost, you know, like six of ten going into the playoffs. Oh yeah. Um, but at the same time, it they weren't ready for that one either. Um, yeah, but the the major problem stems from the now you have one day's difference in rest for the Rams going into their next game. Uh, yep. And. Yeah. Yeah, one less day of rest against Tampa Bay and Tom Brady, probably not the best thing. Yeah, that's just like time. in terms of fairness, especially when you don't have to have so many games where having a Monday night game actually makes sense. Yeah. It it just doesn't seem right. Um yeah, no. I, I think it it was and one of the things is like you already see how in the playoffs they shift kickoff times for Sundays. They already moved them to Saturday, so somebody's already not getting an extra day if they're playing Sunday compared to the Saturday participants. But the Saturday games, you don't even get 1 o'clock games anymore. Like, as if the regular season... I, and I know it's ratings-driven, but it, it's such a... um a forced activity to try to put everything under peak viewership. And I mean, at some point you run out of slots where I mean, networks aren't competing with each other, which is why I'm sure ESPN takes a Monday night football game. Cause otherwise if they're only doing four o'clock and eight o'clock games, you have now with an expanded playoff bracket, viewer time slots where you can fill that and still maintain high numbers of viewership. Yeah. So it's like in the opening round, the wild card round, as we saw, because remember, we now are seven playoff teams and only one team gets a bye. So yep, it's not that's the correct. Two team by. So it used to be that the wild card had two games per conference. Now there's three games per conference. Yep. Um, and if you're going to then take away the one o'clock time slot, it means four o'clock and eight o'clock are your time frames, and you have six, two extra games that don't meet games, that time. Frame. Right? Yeah. Yes. So you have two between Saturday and Sunday, four o'clock, eight o'clock. You have four slots, so you have to find it, and that's where I think the Buccaneers game last weekend came in because that one I think was a one o'clock. And yeah, the Eagles, and then the Monday night game. So, so I just it, don't see why they didn't just put both one o'clock. Like you have six games, yeah. and you have a weekend. Like, what the heck? Yeah, and you know, obviously, you and I talk about this when we were planning out the episode. But my maintaining was, if you're going to do a Monday night game, as much as like I'm sure the West wants 
their team to be on Monday night during the regular season. They want to be in prime time in the regular season. Oh, yeah. They don't want to miss a playoff game. Neither one of the fan bases on the West Coast wants to be leaving work at the same time that a playoff game starts. Yep. So, you know, it, it. I'm sure it's not lost ticket sales because it is the playoffs, but it certainly factors into the balance for the average person who's working that day. But I mean, also, like, I I didn't tune into that game. I did. Because I had the over, which did not hit. Yeah, but I mean, I just, like... Actually, maybe it did hit, but Kyler Murray did not help. <laughs> Yeah, it's like I I just didn't have the time to tune into that game. Uh, I'm like, it. so the over was the over was forty eight and a half, and I, by the second quarter, cashed it out because I was like, if I get seventy five percent of my money back, I'm good with that because Kyler and the Cardinals have no offense today, and it ended up being like forty three points. Uh, okay, so, a smart cash out. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's take a look at the bracket. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, here we are. Um, we got the Rams and the Buccaneers, and we're, fil- we're recording this on a Sunday afternoon today. So we now know that the Packers have lost to the 49ers in a game where yep. I think everybody's a little bit surprised that the Packers had that little offense. Um, yep. But at the same time, the 49ers do have a good defense. I would not say it's an attributed win to Jimmy Garoppolo. He was throwing a lot of duck spiraling passes. Um, We know that the Chiefs and Bills get to uh, play for revenge later today. And that the Bengals knocked off the number one seed Titans. So we're now looking at a playoff where both number one have been knocked out yep in the first day possible yeah i mean the both teams that that got the bye didn't make it past one game you know and honestly i say this partly as a steelers fan because every time the steelers had the bye they lost it but part of me is just against having the bye to begin with because you have to be you have to have a certain amount of momentum normally to really hit the playoffs and be strong in the playoffs. I mean, the thing is, right, the bye can also be seen as like a... It is something you fight for, right? It is why... Like, if the bye didn't exist, would you really have teams try and get the first seed? It it can point, be argued that you won't. I'm not saying that that's the truth, but it can be argued that without some type of incentive, then the prestige of the first seed doesn't hold up. I will um, say this. I think the second bye week meant more when there were 17 games, or means more now with an 18 games uh, regular season and 17 games per team versus the old format with 16 games because yes it's only a one game difference but the toll that another week of the practice and all of that has on the body is probably more notable all right so so um, and so but the thing is is i don't think at the end of in the like the years of that format that it necessarily changed anything if you like let me put it this way the buffalo bills beat the crap out of the patriots last week yeah but buffalo started very uneasy in their season they were kind of yeah you know up then down up then down and so were the chiefs who beat the crap out of the steelers but both those teams found their stride late, and they find their stride by having momentum. You but can the... argue that the Bills and Chiefs still win their games respectively, but maybe not by the margin that they do. Sure, but at the same time, it's just, again, it, it's another form of like incentive. So I don't necessarily think that they should get rid of it. They should obviously... Maybe you're right, they should take a look at it and what it actually does. But as a form of incentive, 
it's okay. I think well, they're not going to get rid of it because at this point they have an odd number of teams. So yeah, now they have an odd number of teams. So. And, and as we both just said about the Monday night thing and how ratings are so important to the NFL, it doesn't make sense for the NFL to then add an eighth team just to get rid of buys. Yeah. I mean, college football doesn't want to do it, and they have 150 teams in in that FBS. Yep. So, like, if it's not going to happen there, and it it should. But But college is also a different, uh, you know, a different, like... It's a different animal, and they understand that they're not going to get the ratings shared. But also, like, in... College football's case, I would be against adding more teams because if you look, you have 99% of college athletes who are not going to go professional, right? If you look at the top four teams, you still are probably looking at like 50% of those players not going to go professionally. So so what the heck does it matter that they have an extra game per year if they do that well? Because, and I, I disagree with you on that, because the college football playoff committee has shown time and time again that they're not willing to give a team a chance that's outside of Pac-12, Big Ten, Big 12, ACC, and uh, SEC. They finally did it with Cincinnati this year. Yeah. And then they threw Cincinnati to the Wolves, basically, and made them play Alabama. Yep. Now, it would be in the great interest of everybody because universities make more money there's more ratings, and yes, college players who aren't going to be in the NFL get more spotlight if that tournament is bigger. Because look at what – look, I understand that March Madness in basketball and football is different yeah. than they're, – they're different animals in themselves in that area too. But in college basketball, we've seen small teams. Oh, yeah. But I mean also at that point, the – NCAA committee for March Madness and the 68 teams that end up making it right so, some some number like that um it's just they have to fill the tournament with more team right it's just how it is right i don't think that increasing to 8 gives enough parity to the number of teams that will be selected oh no i'm not saying it should stop at 8 if they expanded it i think a full 16 would be Nice, but the thing is, is the college football season would have to start even earlier or end later. For that, and I also think that's bad for like again, in terms of the number of players in college that are not necessarily doing this to go to the professional level. Do they really want to devote that much more time? to oh, no, man. this the- it's just it's it's a very hard thing to balance i and that's why i think college football is a completely different animal right well, they have a lot of different of- things to worry about whereas the, the- whereas the nfl is literally you're paying people to do this professionally they have vested interest in trying to do to win the super bowl well i think now because in the past couple of years there was that COVID eligibility year where college players yes. got to stay back. So they were allowed schools that had fifth, sixth, and seventh year players. And on top of that, now that there's the NIL where players can get paid, there isn't as much incentive to rush it and get it over with because they can be maybe not adequately, but still somewhat compensated. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sooner or later, the video game is going to come back for college football. And then, you know, because of name and image and likeness, your name lives on longer by being there a yeah. while. No, no, I, I agree. It does have some appeal to it. Uh, I agree. More, more than ever, really. But uh, I, I, again, like, I agree with all those. And you're completely correct in saying that that could be the way that they go. I'm just saying that there's a lot more to college Sports that have to be taken into consideration. There is, but if you have that leftover eligibility, I'm just going to throw out the other thing, which is the academics can be over and you still be eligible. Yeah, yeah. Because you can be a graduate and not have to worry about the 
the student athlete balance by the end of your season as you're pushing for playoffs at that point. That would be nice. Right. It would be convenient. But also at that point, if you're not a if you're a graduate, you you would still be balancing something with football because it's not like you can just live on zero. Because of NIL, they wouldn't have to. Oh. Mm. True. True. Or or they would be less inclined to because we don't know. I I don't know the exact compensations for NIL. It's it's just like partnership based. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so I mean they they'd be less inclined to at least. Okay. Well, good to know. Um, but yeah, so here's our so we have what Chiefs and Bills still to play in Bucks Ram. Yeah, which I I think that the Chiefs and Bills is going to be a big game. I don't know that because, like I said, both those teams scored early and often last week. Mm-hmm. Something tells me it's not going to hit the same way this week. I think both defenses are kind of in tune yeah so i mean like again i i think the chiefs bills game is a better game or is going to be a better game than the bucks rams game but i mean we'll that see bucks rams game sounds like it's going to be pretty high scoring yeah but at the same time like in terms of like a complete football game like you're going to look at the bucks rams game and you'll be like where's the defense everything's just being slung around and you're just getting a lot of scores right Whereas I believe that the Chiefs Bills game will give us like a good balance of offense and defense and like and the like. So uh, I don't know. I would agree with that. All right, on to um, we still have no other I- idea about the MLB I lockout, that, correct? That, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, there was supposed to be. There was supposed to be uh, something. Somebody, one of the sides was, I think it was the Players Association was going to come with a uh, counter proposal soon. Okay, good. I well, we'll see. Tomorrow, when when we tomorrow, get an update, we will be reporting on it. Yeah, as we often do, because as you can hear right now, this report that we're giving, very accurate. <laughs> All right, so we want to talk about a few NHL teams now. Uh, so yeah, yeah let you take the lead on this. One. So Florida. So w- when I was taking a look at what was going on in the NHL, right? Florida, ever since the COVID break, I guess I'll call it, had been on a tear. They'd been like eight zero and one, scored an abundance of goals, well, and it, it th- they had two seven plus goal games in that span, which is amazing. So, it's just, what the heck is happening? Like, don't get me wrong. We both know that Florida was a good team and they were showing up. But this is just on another level. For nine nine games in the NHL is what, a tenth of their season. So, that's a pretty good streak of games to string this together. And you can also add a six-goal performance on the 20th. Yeah. Again, and they continue. On the 20th, they had a six-goal performance. Like... I was just surprised that they were able they're able to be this hot as a scoring team for this long. That's... They did have a five one loss on the eighteenth. Yeah. Hey, but again, that one it, game. It, like, one victory. All on again, all NHL like like if we're gonna look at the playoffs, right? You you're you're playing seven games so one loss five one if you surround it by a bunch of six seven eight nine goal games it doesn't matter it, so they currently are tied with the lightning for first in the atlantic 61 points they have a goals for differential over the lightning of 18 right They're and plus 18 when's the last time lightning team. when is the last time that you would say that the florida panthers are anywhere near the lightning and to put that in perspective, right now, the Rangers are number one in the Metro Division. They have 129 goals scored. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. The Rangers number one in the Metro. That's how bad the Metro is right now. Okay, let me put it this way. Uh, nobody in the Metro is above 139 goals for. Yeah. 
and the Panthers have succeeded that by about 20 or so. Yeah, and that's like, this team is just on a tear and continuing to do so. Sure, one game blip of being uh, losing 5-1, but like, more NHL playoffs is a seven-game series anyway. A one-game blip is okay. More games, goals for than the Avalanche by two. Yeah, so, I, I like, it just blows my mind that the Panthers... Like, not that they're this good, because they obviously did some things and made some moves well, to be this not good. Only, not only are they this good, they also have lower goals allowed than Vasilevsky and the Lightning yeah. at 117, which is still high. The yeah. Maple Leafs have given up less. Yeah. Um, Hurricanes so, have given up less, which sounds the shit out of me. But also keep in mind, they have over double the goal production of the Islanders. Well, that's they have another eighty goals scored so far this year. The Islanders are a lost cause, man. Which is sad. They were supposed the to be very good. Have... They really should be. Yeah, and here's why they're not. They have nine less goals than the Coyotes, <laughs> who have twenty four points. Oh man. Yeah. So I mean, like, I. I actually like that there's this kind of Florida rivalry going on right now where the, the Panthers are keeping up for a pretty good chunk of the season, right? It's been so long. Yeah. And... Well, you know, the Panthers will always, in my heart, be, or not my heart, my mind, Ooh. be that team that was always in the old standings when it was top three per division, and there were three, or it was, yeah, top three. Two or three per division in the old format. Three division three. and two wild cards. Okay. So the Florida Panthers were always like second in the division on when that division was really bad. And yeah, but the division was in. really bad. And they would always sneak in despite having like 72 points on the year and then make the playoffs and then get trounced by a real team. Yep. And so for that, they'll always kind of be synonymous with that for me because they still haven't won a playoff series yeah. even after they spent big money to make the team competitive. And it will always be a team that's synonymous with the empty seats. Yeah, but also it will be a team for me that's synonymous with their rink actually melting. <laughs> like Atlanta did. Yeah. Just but also like the whole team. Like, all that aside though, like, you're actually, like, before when the division was bad as a whole, right? You're not looking at the Panthers ever putting up any of these types of numbers. Like, 160-something goals for? Right. There's they're, no they're way in a peak, whole season. Their peak at that point of time was an individual who had a good season. Right. It was but never also, about anybody else. But also, like, the like goals Brian against Campbell that they have. revived his career. Yeah. I, I, the goals against that they have, like, right now, you would never expect that at this point in the season from the Panthers before. So, it's just cool to see that you actually have some type of Florida rivalry going on, and it would be cool to see them meet in for an actual series. Oh, yeah, it would be great. Unfortunately, that's not how yeah. the format works. Uh, I know, it would be they, great. It's not how the format works. They a wild card against everybody else. yeah. So, I, I mean, you know, one can hope, though, in, the in one time, subsequent rounds. The one time we're in sports, pegging a weaker team versus a stronger team as a matchup is like, eh, I mean, do we have to? Yeah. So, I mean, like... Just kill all the strong... It's like when you get in, into, like, when a plane goes down in the Himalayan mountains or something, it's like, you, you got to go after the strongest amount of meat per first. And then you go down the line. It's a game of survival. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. So, I mean, like, the Panthers have just been really surprising coming out of the break. And the other team that has been quite surprising for us, which Jeremy alluded to, is the Avalanche. Do you, you want to bring up the stats we have for the Avalanche? I would love to. And I'm going to interrupt my writing on a post-it of the word post-it that I was going to post on the wall so I could post it so that we could bring up the Avalanche um, who are at 59 points 
a solid two points behind the overall President's Trophy race. Um, they are 28 wins, eight losses, three overtime losses, with 165 goals for, 118 against, with a goal differential of 47. But more importantly, in their last 10, they're 9 0 and 1. Yeah, again, like they're having a tear. Also, I'm this pretty sure. Game win streak. Yeah. They. They're having a tear. They haven't let, they've gotten a point in their last 10 games. Even though it's an 8-game win streak, they still have a loser's Six point game. in that one loss. 6-game win streak. Uh, yep. So, again, they're another team having a tear. It's just, like, weird how coming out of breaks, like, these two teams are just going at it. Like, what the heck did the break do? Breaks usually kill teams in momentum-wise, or it takes teams a while to get back to it. So my thought though is that okay, so their top goal scorer is rounding in with twenty one. Yes. Uh McKinnon is at no point in the uh core stat leading categories at the top of any of them. That's correct. Uh, uh that being said, this is a team that you know how when a team is competing for a title, they have a window to do so. And Colorado's window is still open, but it started about two years ago. Yeah. And a lot of having the window open is players in their prime. But and also... As they hit like, their prime, they're in, they become at an age of injury concern. Yeah, but also, like, if, if you look at the Avalanche, right, you, you've just alluded to, like, their top goal score right now is 24, correct? Yeah, uh, 21. 21. And they have 165 goals for. Yep. That indicates that at least they have a good depth of scoring. Yes. So, even though you can you can say that they're not... At the beginning of their window, they're somewhere in the middle of it to the tail end. It is looking good end, due but... to this fact. Yeah, it's looking good. I wouldn't say tail end because McKinnon and Rotten and obviously it, it's like how the Penguins still believe that if they have Crosby and Malkin, they still actually have a shot. So like in that same idea in the same way that the Oilers will always think they have a shot if they keep Dreisaitl and McDavid and Marchand and you know and uh was it Pasternak in Boston yep like in the NHL if you have the two-headed monster you can you can consider yourself a quote-unquote contender well, for a while I think you can consider yourself a playoff team I don't know about being a contender well, because of how it's set up now, where you're pretty much guaranteed in the playoffs to play against your division. If you own your division, yeah. that's all it really takes to be a contender to. You can be the worst team against every other division. Yeah, but true. If you own your own division, then you're fine. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. You'll make the conference finals. That's enough to be a contender. Yeah, so, I mean, we just wanted to highlight these two teams in the NHL where they're just on a tear after the break. Who do you think of the two teams sustains it more, though, going into the playoffs and carrying it out? I mean, I would love to see Florida do something in the playoffs for once. But okay. going off past show. performances, you have to say that the Avalanche have the past to back it up. Yeah, because they, what, made the conference final? Yeah. And so... That's my opinion. I would love to see Florida actually do something, win a series. Mm -hmm. It'd be great. And, you know, they deserve something. They've been doing so well. So. Yep. All right. I mean, I'm in the same boat as you. I do not think that the Florida Panthers sustain this. I think at some point it does catch up to them. And what the fuck is wrong with the graphic? Yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, anyway. So, the league filled the Olympic break with 95 games, I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah, let's talk about what the league did so that they could, you know, not send players to the Olympics. But let's see what they're going to do now. Yeah, so so there's 95 games. I read the uh, devil schedule and they added like a, st- a five game homestand and some other stuff. Um, it is nice, at least for the devil's uh, sake, like. If you're going to add these games, you might as well just put certain teams at home to try to minimize risk. But that doesn't do anything for the fact that there's still the away team that you put on like a road trip across every other state. Yep. Makes no sense. I guess if you if you like get COVID and you have to um, put yourself into quarantine, it would be nice to be on the five game homestand. Yep. Because you, you just never have to worry about anything. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Um, did you have a chance to look at like the penguin schedule or anything? I think they're part of our homestand, by the way. Um I uh, wouldn't doubt it out. They just got off um the big California trip. You know how teams in the Metro and the Atlantic they just go and, you know, knock out all the California There's- Two trips. The California and Arizona trip and the Canada trip. Yeah, they didn't do the Arizona one though. Yeah, I know. So I mean I mean, we were expecting this. I don't think I expected ninety five games, but I, I can see why, you know, hey, whatever. Okay. Alright, so yeah, we have the same five game of homestand too, because here we go. Twenty are actually longer. Today against the Jets. Coyotes on the 25th, Seattle on the 27th, Detroit on the 28th, so, and Kings on the 30th. So my my one concern is they added all these games, yet the season is still ending at the end of April. Well, yeah, because they're not sending anybody to the Olympics. But then they, on top of it, as you know, decided, well, if we're not going to send anybody to the Olympics, let's, you know, get some dollars in here and... No, but if you're going to put 95 games from where they are to the Olympic break that was taken away, you can't shorten the regular season by, like, two weeks or something. The Olympic break was, like, three weeks long. Like, what the heck are you doing? You got a good point there. Right? It's like, what the hell is this? Make a really good point. All right, well, now that we, we've established that, like what the heck is the NHL doing with their planning, let's see about the All-Stars. So, uh, what do you think about the participation awards for the Atlantic and Metro? Participation awards? Um, you know, I, I don't really think much of All-Star rosters at this point because they've, not that it ever was very good, but now that there's four All-Star teams, they really make it hard to like actually warrant actual all star nods for some of these players because when it was just east and west, you didn't have to worry about the division participation being a part of it. It was just kind of yeah, the like best that each conference had to offer. Like, now it's like the a second pairing defenseman on the fourth worst team who's having his best career year will make the all-star game because he's probably the best player to represent that team. Right. And, and my my point is like, I, I'm a devil's fan. So I'm, I I like the fact that Jack Hughes is there. He definitely deserves it out of everybody on the devils, but does he really like deserve it over like a Stamkos or somebody else? I can't really argue that. Right. But it also comes into the fact of because there's four teams, they'll never have to compete with each other Mm -hmm. for a nod either. Um, Yeah, true. Let me see here. I'm going to try to look up the rest of these guys because I'm having a little trouble reading. Um, So we've got... I mean, if you look at it, right? Like, Suzuki is probably having a career year, so he's there. But I don't know. I actually haven't watched too much of the Canadians. Um... Edmund and Vasilevsky got it from the uh, Lightning, so you don't see a Stamkos, which we'll get to in a little bit. Matthews and Jack Campbell for 
the Maple Leafs, they they have two players from those teams, which means they both probably deserve it. Okay, but at the same time, Lucas Raymond from the um from the Red Wings made it, and um, oh yeah, got, we can he's look got at thirty three points, and he's nineteen years old. Could have stand for being in the NHL at nineteen years old, but like I, I don't see in, that if eleven goals and twenty two assists is the reason that you make the All Star roster. Like, in an East and West roster, that doesn't happen. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, no. It's... I mean, so, I, I mean, let's just look at these rosters that we have here, right? We have Freddie Anderson and Tristan Yari for the Metro's goalies. What do you think of that? Also, uh, I'm not reading. I don't think that I'm reading the right article. My apologies. This is the All Stars based on what the fans said. Yeah, but Oops. so Freddie Anderson and Tristan Yari is the Metro's goalies. What do you think? I think Freddie Anderson has earned it. The goal differential speaks for itself when it comes to. But I wasn't. They have a lower goals allowed than either Vasilevsky in the Lightning or the Florida Panthers. Yeah, but in terms of all Metro goalies, you th- like I agree that Freddie Anderson has made it, sure. But what about Tristan Yari? Yari, I mean, at this point, he may be the worst two-time All-Star. <laughs> in, like, especially two nods in the past three years. But like, I will say this, for how bad is that he was in the playoffs, he's been a lot better routinely this season. His goals allowed is way down um, from last year. Okay. And he looks to be more comfortable. The problem is is that in terms of a Penguins representative for the All-Star game, he'll never be what Penguins fans want the oh, yeah. All-Star God to be. Yeah, that's true, but again. Like, the, the Penguins would have rather, I'm sure, sent Gensel which Gensel got in on the fan vote. Oh yeah, we'll get to the they fan vote in a little bit. Jari later. Yeah. So I mean, like these are what the NHL has decided the All Stars are not not the fans, right? So here are the Atlantic Division, and look at let's look at the Central and Pacific, right? Mm-hmm. Um. So here you have Cam Talbot and. You see Saros, right, as your goalies, which I think they're actually pretty good. So, Cam Talbot. I mean, he flamed out with the Coyotes, didn't he? Or no, yeah. I'm thinking of Anti Ranta. No, Talbot There's was on Ranta. the Oilers. Okay, not better, <laughs> by the way, for goaltending standards, not better. Yeah, but anyway, like, I mean, hey, he was the second wild to be put on the team. So he has some merit, I guess. We'll say the wild have done well this year. They yeah. really bounced back from being a dumpster fire. Yeah. Whatever Billy Garen is doing is... Uh, yeah, and then... He, he seems to have settled whatever, you know, train wrecks were going on with Kaprizov, too. Yeah, because like and, there was that whole "was he going to stay or go" thing in the off season. And then you have like John Gibson for Pacific with Thatcher Demko. I I can't really make comments about either of them. I don't watch the Pacific too much. But then you have also like Johnny Gaudreau who gets a bid along with McDavid and Drysaitel, who definitely were going to be there anyway. Mm-hmm. What the heck are these teams, right? See, my, my thoughts, and I'm sure Goodrow's having his typical good year, but when it comes to hockey and, like, there is no parity because they don't really – They I think they took away the fan vote, and rightfully so, after the John Scott thing. Um, But, but it, if you look at, at this – At the same time, if there's no abnormal in how – um, things work out if there's no breakthrough star, they will find a way of sending the same representatives over and over. Yeah, but also if you look at this, right? 
your only defensemen on these rosters are Cal McCarr for Central and Alex Petrangelo for the Pacific. Mm-hmm. What is that? There is no way that that's the case. Yeah, I'm sure the defenseman probably comes in in the fan boat, but we'll see. Yeah, uh, yeah, but like, how as a... You're trying to promote the game with this, right? You are basically just telling the fans that, oh, we had to include a defenseman, so here you go. Well, you know, in a normal year, yes, they're trying to promote the game but at, and grow it. But at this point, because of this year being an Olympic year and the fact that this All-Star game kind of like happened out of nowhere, it's a little bit late to grow the game so you can afford some parity because there's still going to be Olympic hockey. Like... <laughs> It's yeah. not going to be the same quality of play that you want it to be. Yeah. But if you want to grow the game internationally, the international play is going to be there. But and at the same there. time, the, like somebody watching the Olympics, right? They're going to say like, oh, I want to see the best of the best of the NHL. So if Well, the NHL didn't allow that to happen. Yes, exactly. But that's my point, is that they're not allowing that to happen. And I understand to a degree, but you're you're also showing that like the best of the best are all scorers. Yeah, and now Team Canada can't charge, you know, two hundred and fifty dollars for a replica jersey of a guy who played for two weeks on their team. Yeah. So last men in, right? And you're actually wrong. All of these guys are forwards. At least there are more goaltenders. Well, you got Stan Coast, who had to come in on the fan vote for some reason. So uh, there's that. Edsel came in because um, was it was it Kim Atkinson? Yeah, it was the vote in, and then decided to opt to out go. for injury reasons. Yeah. So again, like, what kind of game are you promoting? Where you still you're playing three on three hockey? You still have a defenseman technically on the ice. Like, what kind of game are you promoting? And I mean, it like you said, three on three. It's not much defenseman anyway. At, but it's still a position. Three, it should get, be represented. Right, but because of three on three, you only get one defenseman at a time. The way that the game works now, anyway. Yes, but you only have one defenseman. They can't like you're basically saying that oh, defensemen don't matter. I'm just going to put a forward there when they have to switch. How's that any different from when any good team has a power play? But they still, most power play teams run one defenseman still with four four forwards. Yeah, one defenseman. If it's about growing the game for what it is, which is normally two defensemen, then we have a problem with every day. But no, I'm not saying that, like, it's about representing the like sure you can represent the game but representing the game as three forwards on the ice just going at it does not also speak true to the game i'm not saying that there always has to be a defenseman on the ice but i'm saying only bringing one doesn't bring true parity to what the nhl is representing mm-hmm. I'd agree with that. and that's my problem not not the fact that you don't have to play these guys like i i don't care like just the fact that when you release these lists and I see one defenseman, not even two, it just doesn't make sense. And let, like, I don't care how it is on the ice. I just care that you're showing to the world that the game is mostly just forwards or is only forwards. You're basically saying there's only forwards and this guy is a defenseman here just because we have to. I'm just happy that Chris Latang wasn't an all star because they, if it was more defensemen. And that guy would have been like an eight-time all-star despite the fact he has one goal. Yeah, so, so I mean, if we go back, right, the Metro has Adam Pellick and Adam Fox. Two defensemen. Well, oh, yeah, and did Zach Wierenski. Three. Did you expect a goal scorer from the Islanders? No, no, no. no. But, <laughs> but my point is, my point is that, like, that's more defensemen than I'm expecting. Like, if I'm looking at an all-star team and I see... Two defensemen, I'm happy. I don't expect a third, right? Whereas the Atlantic, they have two, Dolan and Hedman, which both both definitely probably, did, well, for the Sabres, it's probably Dolan 100% of the time. And Hedman, he deserves it, sure. Uh, the thing is, the Metro is kind of at a premium when it comes to elite defensemen. 
because you do still have not only I don't know about that. Well, John Carlson didn't make the team. Latang, I in a in a former life is elite, didn't make the team. Oh yeah, but he's not elite this year. Yeah, but at the same time, I can understand why the Metro has more. Well, I can understand it due to the fact that the Islanders are basically sending a defenseman 100% of the time. Yeah. I mean, because they don't re-sign any of the good forwards. Yeah. But if you're talking about elite defensemen, I think you can only really include the Lightning as the team with the most elite defensemen in Victor Hedman. Yeah. Well, the Lightning haven't put themselves in cap hell. Whereas other teams do. Yeah. So, I, I mean, my, my point is that, like, the these rosters, like, I agree that all the forwards are good, but at the same time, you're not really representing the game as you should, where this is supposed to be a show of the game. And that's just, like, my gripe with it. But, hey, like, they made it good on them. And Lovejoy is in the All Star Game too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. do you have anything to leave us with? So, where do you think the Super Bowl goes through at this point? We now know. I mean, Bengals have passed their their demons that stood in the way, and we now know we have neither the Titans. Or the so standing in anybody's way. I'm it's going to, to rule against the Buccaneers. I'm going to assume that the Bucks make it to the next round, right? And so they'll have to fight the 49ers. I do think if anybody is going to give the Buccaneers their best fight, it could be the Rams. Okay. Just because high power offense against what was once a high powered offense before Antonio Brown went batshit crazy. Okay. And before Fournette was hurt. Okay, but my my point is that I still think that I mean I still think that the Bucks make it past the Rams, and I don't think that the Forty ers put up enough of a fight against the Bucks to stop them from going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I think that if the 49ers have to run through the Bucks, they're screwed. Um, I think that they're probably screwed if they go through the Rams. And the Rams are going to look for revenge. I think that the winner of the Chiefs Bills game makes it to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Because and I think that matchup is completely up in the air, so I'm not going to make a determination on it. I'm not saying I'm picking Cincinnati to make it to the Super Bowl. It's just, God, they've been so slept on. And every time they're slept on, they just go out and pound a team. And but I don't fucking know. Yeah, so uh, I, that's my my intuition is telling me it's Chiefs or Bucks versus the uh, no Chiefs or Bills versus the Bucks. I want to say it's Rams versus the Chiefs or Bills. I think either way, you'd have a really good Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want the Bucks there. I'll, I'll be completely honest. I, I just think, I don't like think Tom Brady in the Super Bowl is such a overused rhetoric. Yeah, but it, not nothing against him. He totally deserves like he's won that much. He's that good. But as a fan, it just gets stale. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I would say that like there's. Just something wrong after 31 years of the Bengals not winning a playoff game. For that, if they were to make it win the Super Bowl in the first year that they hit the playoffs in this Burrow era, it just wouldn't feel right. Um, Because normally a team has to build up. Because even Mahomes didn't 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 do it in his first year starting. Yep. Josh Allen and the Bills have been building for a couple years now. And it, it just, like, you have to fail in the playoffs at some point. Yeah. And that's what makes me think that Cincinnati doesn't make it to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. I do think that their window is wide open. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I 
I do. I'm glad they won their playoff game. I just don't know that it they. Was that happened. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know that they can get to the Super Bowl. It gets like games get tougher, not because of the t- not necessarily because of the teams you're facing, but you also have the pressure. You have like playoff pressure is just different. So we'll see. I I think that this is a good start for them going forward, and they have a lot of they have time to come back and make more runs. But they should cher- cherish all the games they're playing as experience because they haven't had it in thirty some years. And I do think that for the most part, all the fraudulent teams are out of the way now. Yeah. Because, like, the Steelers, obviously, I I said, didn't deserve to be in. The Raiders were more deserving of being yeah. in than the Steelers. And the Ravens did put up a good, or not Ravens, Raiders put up a good fight. Correct. I would have been rooting for the Raiders just because, like, their whole storyline this year is hard to not like. But... You know, when it comes to like true playoff elite, they weren't it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would even say Tennessee was not actually a number one seed. I know the stats said it, but yeah, into the intimidation factor is not as much there with Tennessee as it would have been if Buffalo or Kansas City was the number one seed. True. Um, so, like, it doesn't surprise me that Tennessee lost yesterday. And it definitely doesn't surprise me that they would have lost at home. Yeah. Regardless I, of their, like, regardless of their seed, regardless to who they I lost. I completely in, agree. Tennessee, if you told me Tennessee loses, I would say, yeah, that kind of probably tracks. I mean, yeah. Derrick Henry came back, but what percentage of Derrick Henry came back? Sure. So, yeah. Um, you got anything else? No. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in and catch you next time.